Welcome to another edition of One in 15. As ever, I'm going to get my guests to introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Andy. So my name is Lynn Bardell, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my life, but um, the main thing is I'm not going to talk too much because I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. It's nice to have you, Lynn. Bless you for your time. Um, as you know, this series has been asking people to reflect on one big thing that's been really dominating their thinking lately. What's that one big thing for you? It's a big thing and it, it's dominating my thinking now, but it, it ha is something that it has sort of really for the last two years, just over two years. So I was um, 20, 25 year service police officer. Yep. I've worked um, in the Met and Kent Police. I've worked nationally and internationally posted by the government abroad to advise two foreign governments, carried a firearm, public order commander, all those things. And then in April 2018, I gave all that up, including the salary, mm -hmm. to be a full-time carer for my mum. Sold my house I loved, moved us halfway across the country, and now we live in um, on the Kent coast. And I'm a full-time carer and now entrepreneur as well. Right. So, so, so there's so quite a lot of changes, <clears throat> and I guess that's really pertinent at the moment because so many of us are dealing with changes that have been forced upon us. I guess the changes that you're talking about that, that you've introduced there were partly forced upon you because of your mum's health conditions, but also partly proactive. You, you still had to make that decision that I guess it was in your control. How, how has that felt, particularly, I guess, in the last six months when everything's changed for everyone else as well? It was something that I was aware of. My maternal grandmother, so my mother's mother, um, got Alzheimer's, and it was it was quite quick and, and aggressive. So I know it. You know, it, it is hereditary or can be hereditary. So there was always in the back of my mind that this mm. time may come. I'm an only child. I've no father or no um, close family. So there it was only us. I didn't expect it to happen quite so quickly. Um, or so, so early on. So I was anticipating, you know, having time perhaps for at least till I retired, sure. which would have been at 30 years, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but I didn't have that time. But fortunately, I'd already started the move of retraining as a coach. Right. So in terms of the different sorts of transitions, financially was a huge one. I went from taking home a very, you know, a good salary, it was very comfortable, yeah. to nothing um and the identity transition so from being a police officer which is a really strong identity mm -hmm. so we're you know it's a very family orientated thing in, in terms of you know you're part of a group of people you understand each other's stories and where you're coming from i knew that would be hard um but i thought you know i'd have time to retrain as a as a coach oh. I, I qualified with an undergrad degree um but then suddenly it was all on top of me and I had to just sort of say very quickly for a couple of months and then I had to go. So I did have time to think about it. Ultimately, I didn't have to. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a decision that still I, I could have just sort of left her work to, to the point where she would go into a home. So it was a decision that I didn't have and it was a decision that I did have. It was, it was sure. one of those things. Ultimately, it's about choice and responsibility. Yeah. Um, I still don't have to, to be a carer. It's my choice all the time I can. And there may be a point where I can't. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. But COVID really hasn't made a huge difference um, to me because I was sort of locked in the house anyway. So yeah. I could only go out shopping, really, and that's it. I can't go away, can't go out with friends or in the evening. So apart from <clears throat> saving some money, not going shopping three times a week and only going yeah. once a week, um, everybody else has sort of caught up with me now. So I catch up with friends more on Zoom or, or whatever than probably yeah. I did. So I actually see more of people. Okay, so some of, the, some of the changes that others have been forced to are, are in parallel with changes or, or new situations that you've been living for a while. And some of, the th some of the impacts that I guess some people might be experiencing as predominantly negative, and to be sure there's a lot of negative um, reactions to those changes quite understandably but you've already begun to see some of the benefits so some of those changes have brought more time with friends albeit electronically rather than in person yes definitely the you know the the health risk side of it clearly for for most people and particularly those who are with some you know with somebody who is vulnerable is of great concern you know mm -hmm. the only way really um covid can get into the house is if 
is if I bring it in. So I'm, you know, a hyper sensitive around hygiene, etc. When I'm out and when I come into the house. Um, but my mum already had a suppressed immune system, so I was already a little bit aware. You know, I was already careful, but potentially not as careful as I should have been. So, in a way, that's that's a good thing um, yeah. that I'm more more aware of it. But yeah, everything else really hasn't significantly changed apart from trying to start a business in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, and I'm with you on that. I've, I'm I'm kind of <laughs> coaching for a few years now, but more as a kind of a, as a hobby. Thing, I guess in, in my what I laughably refer to as my spare time where, whereas now as you know as different circumstances mean um, it, it you know it's much more important for me to to make it a viable business but it's a terrible time to be doing that isn't it I mean, or at least there's a lot of um, impact on it that, that we ideally wouldn't be wouldn't be wrestling with so you're talking about the trend that transition and you, you've made those decisions and some of some of which were forced upon you some of which were kind of there they were optional but maybe you had a different response to how optional it really was you know you could not care for your mum but mm -hmm. obviously your preference was always going to be to care for your mum um what kind of wisdom have you got or what insight have you got about for people who are making transition regardless i guess whether that transition is something that they that they feel in control of or something that's been forced on them <clears throat> what are some of the kind of the ways of framing it that you found helpful that you think might might work for other people yeah, I would have considered myself um, a, I'm, I am a real pragmatist, right? that's probably why I became a, a police officer, you know, people are incredibly important to me, and, um, but I had never really considered the fact that I am a, I'm a problem solver, I'm a really practical person, mm -hmm. um, you know, major parts of my career have, have been around that, but what I wasn't probably quite so aware of, of is that I'm less of a, an emotionally available person right now <clears throat> some of that may be connected to the fact that i'm neurodiverse so i have dyslexia and add and and <clears throat> perhaps at, at part of that perhaps it's 25 years of, of being in policing and perhaps some of it's being knocked out of me i don't know mm. but um when i moved you know moved from that that role of, of in terms of policing and who i was and my identity and you know being called mom and being responsible for so many things to being responsible for one very vulnerable human being mm. um, who's a very emotionally available person. She's, um, I, I, and it has been a huge struggle. Now, I've done some big things in my life, taken some big decisions. Um, you know, carrying a firearm was one of them, you know, taking and thinking about the fact, you know, that I may need to, to take somebody on to somebody else's life. And of course they give you the, you know, the, the training, um, psychological training as well as, practical training but I you know I, nothing prepared me for the emotional tsunami mm. of caring for the most important person you know in my life it's just completely overwhelmed me and I realize now you know the psychological flexibility emotional resilience and um, fortunately I you know I've been learning about those for the last sort of six months um mm are going to be key in me being able to continue doing this mm. because you know i've hit several walls at speed um and i now help you know other carers um, yeah. in the same position so yeah big big transition much bigger. this is the hardest thing i've ever done yeah I, well i bet and and it occurs to me as you're saying that that of course all across the country and we're recording this the day after the, the, the kind of the most recent announcement on lockdown and one thing that, that they said on the news this morning was you know the rule of six means that people's experiences hoped for experiences of Christmas might not come to fruition we're a family of six I've got I've got um, three school-aged children and, and a 21 year old um, with me and, and so that means that means at the moment at current understanding of the law we can't have anyone over because we, we're maxed out already and I'm really conscious that um, you know there's a, there's so many people out there who have become more conscious of their role as carers perhaps or, or they, their, their role as carers has been reframed or redefined to some extent lots of conversations my um my youngest went back to school this week lots of conversations with parents there who are struggling with you know the, the idea that they might have to go back to work because they've for all the stresses and strains of um, the last six months homeschooling um, those who are still in work having to try and balance that with working from home you know a number of both mums and dads going i 
I've rediscovered parts of my caring capacity, like, you know, that resilience, that emotional intelligence, the reconnection with, that we've had with our kids that we've maybe taken for granted when they've gone off to school. And they don't want to give that up, as well as maybe now people, some people um, finally kind of coming to terms with the emotional impact on them of the last six months of caring for other people, of caring for themselves, actually, of making decisions, you know, that like you were saying, of not going out of the house or interacting with people very, very limited because otherwise it's going to have such a huge impact on other people. What, what advice have you got for those people, for those people who kind of, you know, not wanting to give things up that they've, that they've recognised that they want to keep because they're good and they've maybe taken for granted and all people who are going, well, I'm exhausted that these walls I've hit, I've, I've gone through some of them. Some of the other walls have just knocked me out. What do I do? Yeah, there's a, there's a good one. And that's really where, excuse me, <clears throat> I've sort of got to now. And it's really for me, having gone through sort of several training courses and I'm learning um, ACT is one of them. So acceptance and commitment therapy. I'm not a therapist, but I'm learning the coaching side of it is really acknowledging and, and actually even saying it physically out loud or saying it to someone, even if it's yourself, that you are struggling and that's okay. Mm. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to have thoughts. I'm just writing a post now. And one of them is around, um, you know, it, it, there's a book, um, a carer's book, about it's called A Selfish Pig. It, it's really interesting, uh, uh, and I can't remember the details. Now, Hugh, Hugh Morrison, I think, is the, yeah. the author. And one of the chapters is around um, pushing them down the stairs. <clears throat> when I read it, I was horrified. I was like, you know, how could a carer, you know, I'm a police officer, how could even anybody think sure. that? But trust me, not pushing them down the stairs. But you have that thought, I wish they weren't, you know, if I, they weren't here, I could go and do what I like. I could live my life. I could yeah. do it. So all the thoughts that you're going to have are okay. The normal, not perhaps pushing somebody down the stairs, but that general, sure. you know, that general thing. And be prepared to think differently. Just yeah. put a different lens on it. And, and, you know, when you think you absolutely can't go any further, just getting into mindfulness i'm doing a course at the moment and meditation and mindfulness nice deep breath give your brain a chance to catch up and then just think okay there is always options there are always always options you know i'm very very analog pen paper and just write it down or some people may want to talk into the phone but give yourself your brain just that chance <clears throat> to think of think differently of how this could play out yeah. how the story could end differently yeah. and whether that's more time you know spending with your children well how are we going to do that and the more options you give yourself the more chance you have of letting that, that sort of stress and that the tsunami of overwhelmness i'm not mm. sure that's a word um you know start to start to sort of get more more flatter more manageable and, yeah. and less so you end up being seasick and then you just can't cope and then if, as a carer if you if you fall over figuratively as well as physically who's going to care yeah so it's okay to be to be selfish in a way so that self-compassion is so so important yeah then it's like putting your you know your oxygen mask on in the plane first you know you're like oh i'd put it on my child first or my actually no you you must put it on yourself first yeah and then you can help others in a much, much better way. So, yeah, always, there are always options and just think yeah. differently. I mean, that's, that's great advice. And again, as you were saying that, I was, I was thinking, oh, so many things you're talking about, resilience, you're talking mm -hmm. about you can't give from an em empty cup, you're talking yeah. about um, be, being consciously and proactively self-aware, which I think is something that, that a lot of us aren't great at. You know, it's, it's like a, it's a muscle that we, that we always need to retrain. And I'm really, again, I'm really, really conscious of how, you know, as a coach, I'm sure you have these conversations with clients as well. You, you, when a client says, oh, I, 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 they, they express something they, they feel, they feel guilty about thinking it or feeling it. And as a coach, you, you, one of the gifts we have is to go, no, that, that's okay. You know, it, you, you might not want to stay there, to be sure. You mm -hmm. might not want to hold on to those feelings or that, those thoughts. But the, the way to move away from them positively and proactively is always to acknowledge that they're there. I love that, um, you know, not the idea of pushing somebody down the stairs, but I love that idea of 
of admitting to yourself that that's that that feeling's there because then you can process it you can go well where's that coming from how do i how do i change this what support do i need for myself or for the person that i'm you know having these dark thoughts about what what other support systems are missing that i can enact and if i can't get that additional support how do i how do i manage with the resources that i've got you know how, how do i cope with that one of the things i've had a, a couple of conversations in these interviews with people is that you know some of us who've had poor mental health or, or very difficult situations in our lives in a way feel a bit more equipped to deal with the covid crisis because we know that we've got to admit when we're weak as well as when we've got resilience and we know that um there are days when we're going to not cope as well as there are days when we've got that energy to cope and that and that kind of in a weird way that's been quite helpful for some of us i think yes i i would agree and my my personality has always been you know I'm the problem solver for other people I take care of, of everybody else <clears throat> and I'm the worst person in the world for ever saying actually I need help so yeah. although now with my you know my social enterprise helping carers I'm really big on you know self-compassion and, and reaching out and I'm terrible at it really bad at it so you know I'm, I'm trying to be my own case study and, and actually say and pull myself up and I did last night that you know it's it's not okay it's not okay to sort of beat yourself up and say you know the the other things apart from guilt which is obviously the biggest one or one of the biggest you know i'm not good enough to do this all those things are actually saying i just need to to express it in a different way now for some people they go on to facebook groups and share their narrative you know share their story and get validation from other people who are saying that's okay i thought like that yeah. in america or australia or wherever and then the next level is saying actually the mindfulness you know the the building the resilience the emotional and psychological flexibility if i'm trying all those and i still am having thoughts that are unhelpful or you know unreasonably intrusive then actually i need to to step out of, the, of even a bigger circle and say yes i do need help um and never to be ashamed for that. I would rather, you know, when I run teams, I, the times that someone's come into my office, you know, like three in the morning on nights and, and I'm trying to get a gazillion things done and they knock on the door and say, oh, you know, mom, can I talk to you? And in my head, I'm like, no, no, I, I'm busy. Just go and you're like, yeah, come and sit down. Yeah. And then they go, whoa. And they tell you, you know, how they're feeling or they're sharing things. It must be so, so difficult. Yeah. And you think, you know, wow, how difficult must it have been for them to share it? And now I can be part of trying to help them. Yeah. So never, yeah, never be afraid um, to. It's not, it's not weakness; it's strength. Um, yeah. To be able to say, you know, today or tomorrow, it's just, it's just a bit more difficult than I can perhaps cope with right yeah. now. That's, that's Lynn. We've run out of time, but I, I love. We've ended in that really positive place that. You know, it's okay, it's okay to admit, it's okay to struggle. It's important to admit that you struggle. I think, you know, one of the, the lessons I always want to encourage people, including myself, is, you know, treat, give people the opportunity um, to, to, to open up and be honest and, and treat yourself the way that you would want, you know, you, you're trying to treat other people. So if, you, if you're struggling, um, admit you're struggling, talk to people about it, coaches and other people are always there. Get the help that you need if you do need more serious intervention help then then get it get it because you can't help other people unless you're helping yourself lynn you've been a fantastic guest thank well, you well thank you very much for having me it's been a real pleasure talking to you and and every time you talk about things it helps you also to settle them in your in your head as well so thank you very much for the time thank you